Man, it is uh, good to be back here with you guys once again. I was just trying to count up. Uh, I think I've actually uh, been here. I, th- I think I'm going on, this is fourth or fifth time, I think. Uh, I've known Ken for quite some time. And, uh, man, he's always uh, just a blessing uh, every time. When I get to, to chat about uh, him and you all around with those 90 churches, I often refer to Ken as being one of those guys that's a, uh, a pastor's pastor. He's one of those guys that loves well, serves well, uh, faithful uh, to the core. And so, man, I appreciate his friendship. Appreciate your friendship. Uh, As Vic said, I do uh, come alongside 92 churches across the greater Indianapolis area. Uh, The picture that you saw with the hatchets, Vic, is when I made a few of them mad and they decided to throw hatchets at me. No, it's, uh, I actually took a group of church planters to, uh, have y'all heard of the, the axe throwing thing that you do, you know, and, and so it was a great event. We, we had a great time. Uh, never could get the, the, the thing, you know, like backwards and, and under your leg and all that stuff, but it was great. If you ever get a chance to go, please do go. Um, but man, here today, to open the Word of God, and I'm excited to do so. Uh, But first, before we get to that, and as Vic said, uh, this is actually my second shot. So I've had the the COVID shot. By the way, I know you're looking at me and say, you don't look like you're 60. (laughs) All right, maybe I was wrong. Uh, And Brett, man, what's he fussing about turning bald? Brett, look at your future, my friend. It's your future. Um, the, so the second one, uh, I had told Ken, I said, listen, the second one I hear is, is kind of rough on you. And, uh, and sure enough, I woke up at like 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm going, I'm going to have to call them and tell them. Like, but I took some, uh, took some Tylenol, a leave, doing well. Uh, but just in case I pass out, somebody's ready to jump in and, uh, and take over. But <laughs> with that, let me see if, oh, can I do it? Look at that. Maybe. I'm not holding my tongue right. Let's try. What do you think, Phyllis? Y'all talk, talk amongst yourselves while we figure this out for a second. <laughs> this is when the sound guy begins, you know, little sweat beads pop out on his head. If you just want to do it manually, if my thing ain't going to work, that's fine too. So, but I do a little tap dance, maybe somewhere. Oh, almost. That looks good. How y'all doing? It's good to see you. Good to see you. Technology is great. Somebody say amen. Except when it's not. All right. So that's okay. Well, (laughs) let me say that uh, it has been quite a 2020, amen, right? And uh, man, when you think about uh, all the things that we have experienced, that we have been through, that, uh, you know, maybe even personally, uh, maybe, you know, you've kind of walked through that valley, or you know someone who has, and, uh, you know, we've, we've seen uh, people uh, their lives turned upside down in many ways. And I don't know about you, but when you know, we look at these kind of things, we know that um, it's not by mistake. Uh, it is not, you know, this did not catch God off guard uh, that we are walking through this period of time for a reason and a purpose. And so uh, even though we, we kind of look at these sorts of things um, deep down, uh, we kind of want a do-over. Amen? You know, what, you know what a do-over is? When I was growing up, a do-over was like if I'd be shooting hoops with somebody and, uh, and I'd miss, I'd say, do-over. You'd pass the ball back. I'd get another, sh- you know, another shot, you know. And uh, in, in golf, it's called a What? A mulligan, right? Right? So if you hit... And so how many of y'all would like a do-over for 2020? Right? <laughs> the 
back row. Everybody's hands up. Yes, I would like, yeah, a second. And aren't second chances fantastic? Amen? So we're going we're gonna to actually unpack that today. We're going to look at, at uh, maybe some stuff happening. Uh, we're going to look at, uh, at some second chances. Turn your Bible with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Hey, look at that. Hey, look at that. All right. Give the sound man a round of applause. Or video man. I don't know. Which, who, who, the tech guys. The tech guys. Excellent. Yes, what a year. While you're turning to uh, Luke chapter 15 and, uh, and this concept of a do-over, um, I was looking up some memes. You all know what a meme is? You know what I'm talking about? And a meme is kind of a pictorial representation of, you know, a concept or a thought. And, and so in that, I was looking at some memes for 2020. And uh, his, you can't maybe see that, but that is, that's the guy from the Twilight Zone. So uh, historians in 2070 introducing a documentary about 2020. What you're about to watch is a nightmare. Now for us, for us, over 50 crowd. Okay, if 2020 was a drink, what would it be? You ready? A colonoscopy prep. <laughs> See, all the old, old, old folks are laughing about that because they know what that's like. And of course, 20, this is uh, Jennifer Aniston uh, shooting. It's been hard on all of us. Right? Right? fact, right? I mean, you know, when we think about, you know, this past 2020 and, and you know, this concept of, of getting a do-over, uh, it really is refreshing. And I've had, you know, those instances where, man, I've made some wrong decisions or things have gone bad. And, and there's been times in which I've got to back up and, and try it again and look at, man, which way did I go wrong? How did that happen? So Luke 15, we're going to actually, uh, we're going to read verse 11. We're going to start there. And here's what it says. By the way, this is going to be a very, 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 very familiar passage of Scripture. This is not going to be anything new. You've probably read this from the time that you were in, uh, you know, vacation Bible school as a child. But uh, starting in verse 11, it says, Then he said, this is Jesus speaking, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living, or your Bible might say reckless living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will open up, Father, the, just the gates of heaven today and pour out upon us a blessing that is too great to receive, that we may hear from your word and that it will transform us 
Father, that it will encourage us, that it will equip us to serve and worship you in a greater way. Father, I pray that you be with us in these next few moments. Help us to draw close to you and hear from you today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to look at something familiar today, but hopefully in a new way. You know how, how it is when you, know, you give a, a kid a, a Christmas present and, and they dive into the Christmas present, right? And it's kind of a whatever, it's a cool toy. And then they play with the box, right? And the box becomes a spaceship or a race car or whatever it is. So that's what, kind of what we're going to do today. I want you to look at this passage. I know you're, gonna, I know you, you're saying, Chris, I've heard this sermon a hundred times. And in fact, you probably heard it the last time I was here. And the fact is, is that we want to look at it again because there is so much that we need from this passage. In fact, I would put to you that this is probably the most important parable in all of Scripture. And I'll show you why. This is actually, you know, from this whole chapter, it's actually, you hear three different parables. You hear about the lost uh, sheep, you hear about the lost coin, and then the lost son. And in each one of those, I would put to, to you that it's actually not really three separate parables, but really one with three chapters. And what you see is there is a theme that runs through each one of these. And here's the theme. Lost, found, rejoice. Let's all say that together. You ready? Here we go. Lost, found, rejoice. One more time. Lost, found, rejoice. So when we are looking into this, you're going to see that this is the, the driving theme behind this passage. Lost, found, and rejoice. First of all, we want to take a look at the audience and to know and to understand this parable correctly. We've got to start at the beginning of the chapter. We've got to see who is the audience. Who was Jesus talking to? If you go back to the first few verses of Luke 15, here's what it says. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him. So this was the audience, tax collectors. And, you know, tax collectors, I mean, these guys were not well liked. All right? So, I mean, we have kind of the same feeling today. Tax collectors, everybody say, boo, boo. Sorry if you work in a tax collection. I don't know. But here's the thing, is that these guys were hated. I mean, these they lived in the community, and they would steal from people, and then he, they would send it to Rome, and then Rome would it was totally in control of, of really the known world at that time, and they would come in and destroy places. And so they would, they would this, the, the tax collectors, this was a scandal, all right? In fact, that was an accusation that they would, they would throw about Jesus all the time. You know, he's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. And this was actually a class of people as well. Sinners. I mean, these people were, were, you know, like all of us, a lot of times we want to go, well, we're all sinners. Yes, absolutely. But in this particular time and in this particular place, the culture, very important to understand that sinners, again, were the lowest class of folk. And then he says in the next verse, it says, and Pharisees and scribes, Pharisees and scribes were in the audience. So you got on one half tax collectors and sinners, and on the other, the religious leaders of the day. This is quite an audience. Now, the story, as we go back down in Luke 15, in verse 11, we see this is a story about two sons, all right? A certain man had two sons, and we see that the younger son comes to him, and he wants his inheritance. Now, it sounds very polite when he comes with this ask. He says, and the younger son, uh, okay, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. Whew. We can't miss it. And what we're going to do is we're going to dive into each one of these verses. We're going to unpack it and understand something between the lines. Is that this wasn't some polite request. That this was a demand. This was a demand from his father. Now, I have four kids and seven grandkids. My wife always has to confirm that. I'm never sure how many I have, all right? Seven grandkids. And let me tell you something, as a father, if, if there was ever a time in which that my child ever 
came to me and demanded anything from me, there'd be a little bit of a problem. And all the fathers said, amen. Right? I mean, we would have a sincere, (laughs) very clear discussion. You don't make demands of the father. But even more than that, what the, the subtext of what was happening is that inheritance wasn't given out until the person was dead. Now, we have to see that the fact is is that what the son was saying is like, listen, I wish you were dead, Dad. I wish you were dead. And I want what's coming to me. You have to understand culture here. This was, in fact, a shame. In fact, what he was asking was on, on the top tier of shame in the culture, one of the highest forms of shame. You did not make a demand like this from your family. And what we see is that as as we go through this this passage, you're going to see that there are things going on in this culture. It was a a culture in which shame, you you had to regain your, your place when you'd experienced shame. All right? So... Here's the deal. The next thing that we see, and it's an amazing thing, in the next part of the verse it says, and so what happens is, he divided to them his livelihood. His livelihood. The father actually does it. All right? He actually takes this. But the fact is, is that it wasn't cash. What had to happen is that he was going to take the land that he had and give that to the son. He would deed it over to the son. Now, again, we got to stop and realize what has just happened here. This was the land. To a Jew, this was the promised land given to them by the very hand of God. This was the land is still to this day their closest link to God. That's why they're always fighting over it. That's how important the land was. And he gives the land to the son. Now, when we, when we realize that this promised land, how cherished, we have to realize that this, this was a big deal. And, and what would happen is, when he says, when I read that word livelihood, he divided his livelihood to them, it's actually the Greek word bios, which is actually life. When he is giving him this possession, it's like he's giving him his life. The very life, the very heartbeat of who he is. He's get, that's what he's giving to his son. Now, the fact is, is that then the land would have to be sold. And he would have to take that, he would, that you know, with that he would take the cash, right? And, and this selling of the land, the fact is, is that God gave a provision For his people as they possessed the land. That it would, even if they sold it, it would be returned in the year of Jubilee. So now, let's just think about that for a second. This boy is selling the land. Now, if somebody was going to buy the land but knew that they had to give it back, do you suppose they're paying top dollar? Nope. So not only was it a shame, and it was the land the very connection to God, but it was sold cheap. And the son got whatever he could out of it. And then he takes off. It was sold cheap. And so what happens is that this son rejects everything that he knows. He rejects his family and he goes as far as possible away. He didn't just go down the road. He he took off, and he headed as far away as he could. And here's what we see, and you know the story, is that while he was there, he took the cash that he got for this land, and he spent it all as much as he possibly could, over the top, reckless living, and probably on, you know, uh, partying as much as he could, on prostitutes, on whatever he could, until it was all gone. Now he was broke. Verse 14, when he'd spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, 
and he began to be in want. No kidding. Wow. So the famine hit, and so he comes up with a plan. The the next verse says that he'd spent all, then verse 15, then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. So what we see here is that he said, oh man, it's all gone. Now what do I do? Now understand he was a Jew in a foreign land, in a place that people didn't know him. His family was all left behind. And so he's trying to figure out how to find a job, how's he, how, how he's going to take care of himself. So he says, well, I'll, I'll get a job. And then finally, finally, this person, whoever it is, he, he, he says, all right, well, listen, uh, would you stop bugging me? Hey, all right, here's what you can do. You can just go and feed my pigs. And these weren't like pigs in a pen. These were free roaming And so that's why what happened, the boy had to take the the pigs around to find whatever he could to eat. Because don't forget, there was a famine in the land. And that's what you see, is that this Jewish foreigner takes these free-roaming pigs. Nobody had mercy on him. Nobody gave him any pity. He had nothing. He was destitute. And so when he saw what the pigs were eating, he said, man, well, maybe I could eat what they're eating. And for a Jewish boy, handling pigs, this was about the lowest job. Now I want you to flash back to the audience. The audience of the Pharisees and the scribes. And at this point, you, you can, and just like a movie, like a Steven Spielberg kind of a thing, all of a sudden you can, you, can, you can guess that the Pharisees and the scribes, that they have these angry smiles. They're like, oh man, I know how this is. This is fantastic. This wretched, shameful son has done the very worst thing that he could do to shame his family, and now he's going to get his. And so they were pleased with the way the story was going. He was going to get what he deserves because guilt and shame needed to be punished. Then verse 17 starts off and it says, but. That three-letter word is probably one of the most amazing words in all of Scripture. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here we see in verse 17, but when he came to himself. What an amazing moment. All of a sudden as he's feeding the pigs and wanting what they have and realizes where he's at and what has happened, He comes to his right mind. He realizes his situation. He comes to himself. He realized where he was. He realized what he'd done. He was humbled and that he knew that his father had the answer. Look what he, look what, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger. Now maybe, as we've been reading along, you know exactly what this son is going through. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've experienced that moment, realizing how far you've gone. The amazing thing is that we see is that he says, I know that I've got to get back to my father. And so he turns right around. By the way, that is the very definition of repentance. Repentance is when you're heading the wrong direction and you turn in the opposite direction and head in the right direction. And here's what we see the son doing, is that he realizes where he was and he says, I am headed back. And what we see him doing this whole time, he says, I'm going to rise, I'm going to go to my father, I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, make me like one of your hired servants. He, you know, he, you didn't, let me tell you something. He didn't, you didn't have to coach him what to say. You didn't have to tell him <laughs> the words to use. When you get to this point and you really, really, really understand where you're at, nobody needs to tell you how to talk 
to your father. He knew what he needed to do. He turned opposite direction. He knew what he needed to say. He knew he needed to beg for forgiveness. He was not worthy to be a son. He had no way of earning his mercy. This was a very heart cry from this shameful son. This was, he was pouring out, he was going to pour out his heart to his father and beg for mercy. Beg for any kind of leniency, for any kind of grace that he could get from God. And I love this next verse. This is, this is probably the one that every single time that I read this. It says, verse 20, he arose and came to his father. Look at this next, another but. <laughs> but when he was still a great way off. What? A great way off? What does that mean? Here's what it means. It means day by day, the father would go to the edge of the village and he would peer off into the horizon, waiting and hoping for his son to return. See, the father wants us to return more than we want to return. And can you imagine the father sees the son? You can imagine how his heart must have beat faster and how tears welled up in his eyes because he's a great way off. And the thing about when you love someone, you don't have to see them up close to know who they are. He saw that son in tatters and messed up and dirty and said, that's my son. He's coming my way. <laughs> and here's the next part, just crazy. Look at this. It says, he rose, came to his father. Father saw him, had compassion on him and ran. Okay, wait a minute. Back in this culture, fathers don't run. Kids run. Women run. Fathers don't run. This is not dignified. This is not what a father does. He stays in his place, but we see this father moved with compassion, runs to his son. Why was he running? Why did this happen? See, we gotta, we got to flash back to the Pharisees, flash back to the, to the audience. See, because there are, they're, they're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute this, this story now has taken a bad turn. In fact, I would put to you that in this teaching that Jesus is giving, this was one of the reasons why he was crucified. Because it's not very long after you see the whole plan that comes together for him to be crucified. Because the Pharisees, like, what are you saying? This is not the way it should be. In fact, that, that, that he should be shunned. He should be shamed. He should be stoned. That's what should happen to the son. That's even part of the reason why the father was running to him. Why was he running to him? See, the father ran for joy. I believe that's one of the first things. But then he also ran to protect his son. He ran to protect him. See, because back then, again, in this culture, if somebody like this would have come back, there was a whole thing that they would be publicly humiliated because that's the only way for the family to get back face. To, to, you know, you've heard that if, you know, before, especially in Asian culture. It's like you can't lose face. And that would be the only way if you shamed him. If you, if you hum humiliated him. And so the father ran to the son because he knew the village was going to see him. And so he was going to bear the shame. And that's exactly what you see that happens. Father comes. In fact, that ceremony is called the kazaza. That it, what happened is that if somebody like this returned back to the village, the village would gather. They would gather together, and people would run and get their pots, their, their, their clay pots. And they would gather around this one, and they would throw these clay pots at this person's feet, breaking them. Why? Because they were showing, our relationship is broken with you. We want to have no more to do with you. 
And so rather than having his son go through that, he would receive the shame. He was going to protect his son. So we see verse 20, they embraced, they kissed. He kissed him it says, and he rose and came to his father. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, now remember, this is what he'd been rehearsing the whole way back. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But, again, the great word, but the father said to his servants, did you notice that the son didn't even get out the whole speech? Why? Because the father embraced him and just covered up, covered up his son in his arms before he got another word out. And we see that the father, he tries to speak his prayer, but the father instead, (laughs) look look what happens. This is not supposed to happen this way. The father said to his servants, bring out the best robe. Bring out the best robe? Let me ask you a question. Who in the family has the best robe? The father. In fact, you got to wonder that the servants aren't there going, what did he just say? They, they run back inside to get the best robe, and they're going like, did he say the best robe? That's his robe. That's the father's robe. He says, go get a robe. Go get the best robe. Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. There were four gifts. A robe, it was the father's robe, and it was stating to everyone around that he is now received back in full sonship. Put a ring on his hand. This represented authority, that he would have the father's authority, and he would speak in place of the father once again. And then shoes, sandals for his feet. This was, I I don't know exactly, but this is probably just because he had a need and the father was going to fulfill it. And then the last thing, and he says, bring the fatted calf. Now here's, here's an interesting thing. The fatted calf wasn't just like an overnight gig. I mean, they would spend a lot of time feeding the fatted calf and would only be used for great celebrations, for the highest feasts. And here he was saying, get the fatted calf and kill it. Kill it and let us eat. You know, most people know this this parable. You probably know it backwards and forwards. You could probably preach this message. Here's the problem is, is that most of us really don't understand what the word prodigal means. You know, if you heard somebody, in fact, people, people that have never been in church have probably heard about the prodigal son. And what is the prodigal? The prodigal, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, uh, you'll have a, a wayward child that leaves and they'll say, well, yeah, that's, that's a prodigal right there. So we're always thinking this is the rule breaker. This is somebody who comes in and, and you know, they just flaunt and, and, and leave and they're rebellious. The problem is that's not really what prodigal means. That's not what prodigal means at all. Prodigal means lavish, abundant, over the top is what prodigal means. So I would put to you, this is not the story of the prodigal son, but this is a story of a prodigal father who lavishly over the top abundantly gives grace to a son who does not deserve it. He's the one being prodigal. He's the one that is showing that amazing grace. How sweet the sound saved a wretch like me. What an amazing God. The last part. He says, this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and found. Let's begin to make merry. Lost, found, rejoice. This is the theme. Why is this most important parable? 
Why did Jesus come into the world? What was he? We don't have to guess. We don't have to study. We know because he told us. He said that he came to what? Seek and to save that what? That which is lost. That's why Jesus came. And here you see the perfect example of lost and found and rejoice. Now, you're here today and maybe, maybe you know of somebody. Maybe it is that there's somebody in your own family, somebody in your own life that is like this son. Maybe you're the prodigal running away from God. Maybe it is that you're not a prodigal and you understand this concept of lost, found, rejoice. My prayer for you today is that you would rejoice once again. That once again, you'd be reminded and rejoice over a father's prodigal, amazing, lavish love that he's given to you. If you're somebody that has somebody like this in your life, then let's pray for them. Let's pray that they would come to themselves and they would head back to the Father. But if you're the prodigal, man, today's the day. Now's the time. The Bible says that There is rejoicing in heaven of our one sinner who comes to know the Lord. The rejoicing that takes place in heaven over one. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to Oh, 
Sweet, sweet, sweet.